130 years after Andrew Watson led his Scottish team to historic triumph over England and became the world's first black international footballer, Ifeo Medeke led the Scottish women's team. And unlike the men, they qualify for major international tournaments. Ifeoma joins me along with England great John Barnes, Kathleen Ross and Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. It's Black History Month with a difference on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Alex Salmon Show into the second of our special shows marking Black History Month. This year's celebration has achieved record interest in the wake of the surge in support for Black Lives Matter. Last week, we told the remarkable story of Scotland's forgotten football hero Andrew Watson, who led his team to a devastating 6-1 triumph over England in March 1881. Andrew Watson was Scotland's first and thus far only black football captain. It was 130 years before a Scotswoman followed in his footsteps and captained her country. Ifioma Dieke, one of Scotland's most capped players of all time, joins us from Florida to tell us of the experience of a black woman leading Scotland. And we're joined again by England great John Barnes, who places football in the context of the struggle for equality and justice. In the second half of today's show, we ask Black History 2020 editor Catherine Ross about the unprecedented publicity received by this year's programme of events, while Professor Sir Jeff Palmer argues that revisiting the often unsavoury side of history is still a positive experience. But first, your tweets, emails and messages on last week's show. First, we hear from Andrew, who says, Brilliant episode of the show. Football and black history. Might not be your thing, but it was great to hear from Gerald O'Brien talking up Scottish history so well. Next, we hear from Chris, who says, Brilliant show, Alex. I love this story. What a remarkable and sadly forgotten figure. We should have a statue of him, that's Andrew Watson, outside Hamden as one of our original greats. So much of our history that we don't know. Thanks for telling this story so well. Scotia says, was a great show. Did we detect a lump in your throat, Alex, when describing Pride in Scotland's first black national football captain? I think so. Shirley says, being a woman of a certain age and nonplussed by Fitbass slaver, I was disappointed initially by today's topic. However, I find it very engaging and worthy. I'd heard of Andrew Watson, but was surprised by how much he'd achieved in his life against the challenging backdrop of the age. Glenn says, another note to make is a complete lack of reference to Watson's ethnicity in any of the press stories surrounding him and the team's exploits. It didn't matter. He was simply a man playing really good football. Barry says, fantastic story and one that should be taught far and wide in Scotland and beyond. The Hamden Collection say, brilliant stuff. David says, very interesting and should receive wider publicity. Bobby says, finally, on my mother's side, my five times great-grandfather was black. He fought in the two major sea battles of the 18th century in the Royal Navy and served under two Royal Navy captains against my paternal and Highland ancestors in the 45. He's buried in Milton next to Gravesend. We are all, he says, Jock Tamson's parents, aren't we just? In recent times, the Scotland's men football team haven't enjoyed the same success as the team that Andrew Watson led. However, in contrast, the women's team have been rising steadily through the world rankings. A stalwart of that side winning an amazing 123 caps over 13 years was Ifioma Dieke. She joins Alex to reflect on the significance of a black woman leading the Scotland team. Ifioma Dieke, amazing Scotland career, 123 caps over a 13-year period. Uh, and you saw the, the, the Scotland team, the Scotland women's team, transition from just having a, a handful of professional players like yourself to, to a very powerful squad in the world's top 20 as it is now. How, how satisfying was it to see that development of the side? No, definitely. It's all about growth over the years. And from when I came in, it was me and Julie Fleeton that originally were the only ones playing professionally. And I think with, uh, obviously, it started with Vera Powell and then Anna continued that, like, pushing them to get, like, women's funds and pushing and pushing and pushing to make them train more, to invest more into the programme. 
And I think now you can see the fruition of that. Shirley Kerr has got the benefit of nearly everybody in the squad being professional. And of course, we can all get better as a nation. The more that we train, the more we're in professional environments down at Man City, down at Arsenal and clubs like that. That's obviously going to propel the, the, the national team forward, and it has done that. So and also it gives future generations things to aspire to because now you can go in and you can play pro. Now, Fiona, you, you were born in America but grew up in, in Cumbernauld in Scotland. But therefore, you could have played for the United States uh, or Scotland. So what made you choose Scotland? But particularly goes the United States have a pretty good side. <laughs> No, I mean, they were, and I was going out in a camp with them for like a week before, and I just wasn't excited. Um, and for me, if you're going to play for a national team, yeah, I was born in America, but that's about it. I don't feel American in any way from three years old to, you know, growing up in Cumbernauld and just all my roots, all my school and being Scottish. I felt Scottish more than I felt American. So just because I was born there, it, it, there was no attachment. There was no emotional attachment for me at all. It was just all about purely pay, playing for Scotland, representing them. And it's definitely one that I've never regretted my decision. Now, you captain Scotland just over 130 years after Andrew Watson became the first black international footballer uh, and led his Scotland side way back in 1881 to uh, uh, a memorable 6-1 uh, triumph over England at the, the, at the Oval. What do you think about that story of Andrew Watson uh, and uh, the efforts that are now being made to, to bring that figure back to the... The, the centrality of Scottish football? Like, for me, like, I actually had no idea about it. Growing up in Scotland from, I was three years old, playing for the Scotland team for 13 years, being in and out of Hampton and things like that. And I can't even say that I even knew the story. And, you know, because, again, it's like one that came before you and known their story, I think it's important to carry that over. And that went over my head, and that was only brought to my attention, I think, as of last week. So as of last week, you know, I've, you know, I've delved into the story, I've got to know that a little bit more, and I think that's incredible. The fact that it happened 130 years ago, but we're only finally talking about it now, it's obviously been in the, in the dark for way too long. So I'm glad now that, you know, like more attention is being paid to it because it was a huge achievement and we want to obviously continue that going and continue the talk and actually, you know, recognising that historic achievement and what he did and, you know, obviously the result and everything. So that's, uh, that's an incredible story that needs to be, you know, more recognition. It definitely needs to be given to that. But uh, as a girl growing up in Cumbernauld, which for our international audience is a, a new town just in the outskirts of, uh, of Glasgow, did you, as you were playing football, did you experience any overt racism? Uh, uh, when it, or when you became a, a professional player, did you experience it on or off the pitch? So growing up in Cumbernauld, uh, not too much, a little bit. Um, but I think because uh, my, in terms of my family, my, my brothers, you know, because they were like older and people knew them. So then they knew like I was a girl that played football and I was like Uchi's little sister. So that actually helped me because everybody kind of, because Cumbernauld, like you said, is a small town, so everybody knows. And back then, not a lot of girls actually played football. So that helped me. But then when I go maybe somewhere else, you know, people would just stare at you, you know, call you the usual names and things like that. But and just like didn't let it let, really let it get to me. Obviously, traveling with Scotland, you know, I remember going to countries like Germany, Russia, Bulgaria, and things like that. And again, just comments like that, but nothing like overly like overbearing or like horrendous like you'd see in the men's game, just because I think the audience in the female game was a lot smaller. So you didn't have the big, you know, the microscopes like, you know, like the, the my male counterparts that, like uh, encountered just because the crowds were smaller. But you'd get like little bits and little bits here and there, uh, mainly abroad than in like, say, Cumbernauld, because it's a small town and everybody kind of knew everybody. If you're, my, you're a, a role model for, for young Scottish kids, for women playing football and for black women playing football, eh, are people conscious of how important it is to, to see players like yourself so successful? I think so. I believe so. Because uh, if I look back in terms of, you know, when people ask me my role models, it's like you always look to the, the men's game because that's what, who you see on TV and you just compare yourself to them. But I think it's important for females to have like role models that, you know, like are female that look like them so they can relate to and see their struggles and see how they came through it and learn from like their story and like how they started, how they grew up and how they came through adversity. So it's definitely important. I take that seriously as well. So when I, you know, in terms of like giving back and going to schools and speaking to schools and speaking to girls and coaching, you know, my girls over here. I'm so conscious that, you know, I know what they've gone through, what they're, you know, what lies ahead. 
So it's about trying to help them and navigating through like the difficulties and the journey and what they've got to, uh, what's ahead. So definitely something that you know I take seriously, my responsibility seriously, and I'm um, just um, glad that if my story can help anybody and touch anybody, then I'm happy with that. And do you have a, a message uh, for Scotland and indeed for wider field in, in Black History Month? Again, it's just like you know speaking up, you know, and maybe when things would happen to me when I was younger. I would internalize it, I wouldn't say anything. But I think it's so important, you know, this this day and age especially, that, you know, if you've got anything to say, you know, you stand up, you speak up, you use your voice, and it's about helping people to, ed to educate people and for them to learn. Because in the, the day, we're all human beings and no matter skin color, you know, we all want, to, we want the same things in life and it's about learning to, you know, about each other. If you're Madaiki, the first black woman captain of Scotland, thank you so much for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show. Cool. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me. And so from the captain of the Scotland women's football team to an England great, when I interviewed John Barnes, he had some really interesting things to say about the wider issues of racism in society. It must be difficult to, to be a racist when your, your own team's star players are, are black, is it not? You have to look at the reality of racism in football, whereby I was racially abused by Liverpool fans on a play for Watford, and I'm the exact same person I came to Liverpool, and they didn't racially abuse me. So, uh, you know, football, uh, particularly, you know, up in Scotland, where you know how passionate they are, regardless of whether you're racist or not, if a, a player, as Mark Waters experienced up in Glasgow when he plays for Rangers, if you score goals for them, they'll love you. So, but what I do know is that had I not been a good player, and black players who go to big clubs and do well, of course, even if there are unconsciously or consciously racist people, they don't racially abuse them. But are they bad players? And they play for the same club. So John Barnes going to Liverpool, terrible player, I would have got racist abuse. I know that 100% because it's not personal. It's about the perception they have of, of uh, the, the group that you belong to and their worth in a very in same way as the perception we have of women's worth and, and gay people's worth. So I wasn't under, under any illusion that they loved me because, you know, I'm John Barnes and they love black people because they love me had John Barnes, because I've seen Alex Nyarko, the black Everton player who got racial abuse by Everton fans, and had he played well for Everton like Kevin Campbell did, they wouldn't have racially abused him. So I look at racism in football and racism in society in two different ways. The reality of racism in society, which is much more hard-hitting, much more all-encompassing, and much more serious than it is in football, but it all boils down to the fact that the perception we have of your worth. And if for the transactional benefit, if you do well for them, they will forgive you anything and love you, but that doesn't mean they're not unconsciously racist. So the Liverpool fans who love me, I say, of course you are racially biased, not towards me because you love me, but towards the average black person in the street or the average woman, and that's what we have to change. And how much progress uh, has been made in recent years? Let's look at football first. Uh, and how much is there still to do to, to stamp out racist attitudes? Well, the progress that's made in football, um, two, two aspects of football. First of all, the game, um, the sport, the 90-minute match, and then the institution, which is from the hierarchy point of view, from the management point of view, the administrators. Now, from the playing perspective, it's made huge strides. In fact, there are black players who are disproportionately represented in football because you have more than 20% black players and less than 10% black people in the country. And in terms of players now being paid the same amount of money, when a player, black player takes a shot, the goalposts aren't moved. They don't make the goal smaller. In life, a black, player trying to, black person trying to get a job or, or, or trying to get employment or good housing or access to social care, the goalposts are moved for them. The goalposts aren't moved for footballers. Yes, when you, every now and again, in a, in a, on a Saturday, or if you go to Mo Bulgaria, you will get racist abuse. But in terms of the representation of black people in football, it's disproportionate. They're completely equal. Now, from a management perspective, that's different. There are no black managers, no black administrators, no black people in the higher echelons of football. And there are no black people in higher echelons of government and other, and other industries anyway. So why should football be any different? But why that is, is because Sport, not just football, but sport recognize the transactional benefit of having a black athlete. From Jackie Robinson playing baseball to Muhammad Ali boxing for America in the Olympics, they recognize, and that doesn't mean they're not racially biased, they recognize the transactional benefit of having a black sportsman, which would give them gold medals, give them money, because Jackie Robinson is going to hit a home run. Now, that's obvious. Usain Bolt is going to beat anybody in 100 meters. Mike Tyson is going to knock you out. However, what is the transactional benefit of having a black thinker? intelligent man who can be a football manager. Now, until we change the perception of his worth, nothing's going to change. Coming up after the break, Alex is joined by the editor of Black History Month 2020, Catherine Ross. Join us then. 
welcome back. Black History Month has been celebrated in the UK every October for more than 30 years. Despite this year's necessity of holding all the events online, they have achieved unprecedented publicity as part of the surge in support against racism in the wake of the slaying of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Alex is joined by 2020 editor of Black History Month, Catherine Ross, and Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. Catherine, welcome to The Alex Salmon Show. Hello, thank you very much for having me on. Now, you've described uh, this month, Black History Month this year, as the, as the biggest and best ever. I mean, has there been a huge number of events uh, this year? Yes, um, a lot of them online, though, of necessity. So that's been quite different for us all. We've missed out on the carnivals when we'd be crowds in the streets and moving around. Uh, we've missed out on, you know, just doing general events where we'd all get together to watch films and things that are about Caribbean history or black history generally. Yeah, we've missed the closeness of people. And how would you respond to people who say, well, look, you know, every month should be a Black History Month. Uh, we shouldn't special a, a feature just one single month in the year. Do you think the, the sort of events that we've seen and the coverage that we've seen uh, has justified the idea of a specific month for Black History? No, I'm, I'm really grateful and I'm old enough to remember when it was a history week and then it grew into a history month. Now we're finding that a month is not long enough simply because there's so many events on. So yeah, every month it should be a Black History Month and then everybody can get to experience all the good things that are on, you know, from dramas and um, films and uh, just social meetups to be able to talk about our history and heritage. Now, as you've said, uh, obviously, events have uh, forced you online in the main for, for the History Month this year. Do you have a, a highlight uh, thus far? I mean, uh, something unexpected that turned into a grandstand success? Uh, have you got something you can point to, to which, uh, which uh, surprised even yourself but in terms of how effective it was? Yes, well, we've been on mainstream TV, so that was good. But the um, icing on the cake was when we had to do an uh, interview for Parliament um, for their um, tours of um, history and heritage that's there. So we took part in that, and that was really good. There's so much actually in the building, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, that tell our story that I needed to highlight that so other people will do more of those tours and visits that you can and have. And then also um, people will know that we've been here for a very long time and we have the evidence there um, and we've done a lot. That's the point of my museum is to say we have made positive contributions to the UK and have been doing that since the 1600s. And does it assist in your view the, the, the self-esteem of, uh, of young black kids in particular uh, to know the influence and contribution uh, that uh, figures in history have made that perhaps has been written out of, uh, of conventional history? Well, I think Black History Month also is for everyone. It's, it's for white people. They need to know the gaps in their history and to know that we have been here for as long as we I've just said that we have, and the things that we have done. Um, but yeah, black children especially need to know that because when they're criticised and have negative things said about them, they can point to named individuals and say, but look what they did. And they can also feel good that if somebody could have achieved that in the times of slavery or just post-slavery, then these young people of today will be able to make their mark too. As editor of the Black History Month for 2020, when you were envisaging this year's programme, you must have considered the, the balance, on the one hand, of celebrating the achievements of, of black figures through history, eh, and on the other hand, putting a context to some of the more unsavoury parts of, of history. How did you reconcile that balance as you planned this year's celebration? Well, as in all things I do, I try to point out the positive and, and some of the negative. So the first thing that hit us was the COVID. And for that, um, I was pleased to report that we were on the front line and doing great things. And we were one of those heroes that was celebrated in the national press and, and whatever. But then I had to point out that um, things like 
because we haven't had good accommodation, because of the low paid jobs we've had, you know, we, we suffered um, disproportionately. So I've presented all that, but then I've said, and so what are we going to do going forward? So I've always left um, readers with something to think about how they'll change a the situation, uh, improve or enhance um, whichever aspect they're going to take away from it. Everyone talks about the new normal. Well, in the new normal, I don't want to go back to being on the margins. In the new normal, I want to be able to feel more power and less of this powerlessness that I have. So I'm hoping that our black people are feeling proud and, and um, regenerated, um, but I'm hoping others who are responsible for policy and legislation and so on take notice um, enough is enough. We've waited 400 years and it cannot continue. And as they can see, there are so many of us that are well talented, have the experience that we can make a difference to our country. It's ours too. Kathleen Ross, editor of uh, Black History Month 2020. Thank you so much for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much. Bye. I'm now delighted to be joined from his home uh, in Pennycook near Edinburgh by Professor Sir Geoffrey Palmer. Jeff, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Oh, I'm delighted to be back. And who do you think the key audience for, for Black History Month is? Is it for, for, for young black kids to, to understand some of the great figures who've <laughs> not received the acknowledgement they should have in the past? Or, or, or is it for the white population to to come to terms with the fact that uh, black people have made such an important contribution to history? I think, you know, um, British history or Scottish history or Welsh history or even Irish history um, cannot be discussed without black um, involvement. And, and it's just because I think our historians um, for whatever reason, I think, you know, I've been very strong about this, I think, for self-serving reasons. They had some mythical idea that the Scots do not want to hear about their history, especially if, it, if it's not nice. And thus, they've spent a long time, these historians, manipulating Scottish history to sort of moderate the black bit. And I think this is wrong. And I've spoken, as you know, all over the country. And when I've finished my lecture, the Scottish people have always said to me, why hasn't anybody told us this before? And somehow it's as if the Scottish people can't take their own history. And I think that's almost insulting. But isn't that the case, would it be, from what you've done on the Dundas Monument? Uh, and, uh, you know, people would say, I suppose, in defence of David Hume, not just a, an outstanding philosopher, but a, a rationalist, whereas Henry Dundas was, was also a fearsome opponent of Scottish radicalism, uh, as well as being involved in slavery, that wouldn't it have been more appropriate to allow the negative views expressed by Hume to be ventilated, to be put into context, to, to be part of the examination, without sort of saying, well, we'll get rid of his name altogether, which seems a, uh, it seems a, a different tactic to the, the one used with the Dundas Monument? It's a salutary lesson, you know, that in our time, that if people like, you know, academics or politicians or whatever, if they go out their way to sort of mislead the public and turn people against other people, then Dundas to me is like Hume. Uh, his views on reason and, and whatever is fine, you know, but I remember one of my colleagues once at the Harriet Watts University <laughs> trying to get my support on some issue in the university. And he said, come on, Jeff, you know, we've got to get the spirit of enlightenment. And I said, well, during the enlightenment, I was cutting sugar cake. <laughs> so I am not impressed by the enlightenment. <laughs> Because during that period, we had the most, what I would call, you know, the most profitable evil the world has seen. Don't underestimate the, the, the systemic nature of racism. And I just feel programs like this help because the university, they haven't done their jobs. 
the schools have not done their jobs. And it's probably not the school's fault. I think we need government to say to schools, get this in your curriculum. It's got to be part of the examinable curriculum, not nice to do. And I think if we can do that, we can change this awful attitude to other people where we treat another human being as you know a different species. That's what Hume said. Black people are different species. That means we're like cats and dogs. And that is so untrue because all human beings are perfectly fertile. And that's the definition of a species. And therefore, that concept of race, that, you know, one race is superior to the other. You know, we're one humanity, nothing less. And finally, Jeff, uh, this programme last week featured the story of Andrew Watson, uh, the first yeah. black international football player who, who led his uh, team to, to the Oval in London and hammered the old enemy six goals to one. How, how do you think if that story had been better known and better told, uh, would it have been a role model for, for young black kids in Scotland to know that uh, the most successful Scotland captain in history was black? Well, you know, I think a lot of white Scottish people would actually admire that. You know, I think black kids would, but I really believe that in my time in, in Scotland, you know, a lot of Scottish people have admired my achievements in a sense that, you know, I made a video for the Scottish government some time ago, which, you know, is called We Are Scotland. And I think a lot of black kids would, would, would admire Watson, rightly so. But I can assure you where we've got to get to is where white people admire Watson because he was Scottish. The point is that when I got my knighthood some time ago, there was all these, you know, ladies in Tesco's wanting to give me hugs <laughs> as part of my achievement. And, and they admired what I had achieved. And I don't think my colour uh, had anything to do with it. And, and that's what we want. And I think Watson should be taught and should be admired by all Scots because he was playing for Scotland. Professor Geoffrey Palmer, Thank you very much indeed for joining me once again on The Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much, Alex. See you again. <laughs> we featured a programme on the extraordinary story of Andrew Watson as a contribution to restoring this key figure to footballing history. The fact that it was necessary is a case in point that all too often the contribution of black men and women has been downplayed or even erased from the record books. The importance is obvious. Role models of successful figures can have a great impact on how young people look at their own potential and opportunities. However, John Barnes is surely correct to argue that the task is not to think of black women and men just as role models in sport and music, but also in science, business and even politics. And in terms of securing equality, the key audience for this appreciation is not black, but white. That hour of awareness provides the justification for Black History Month. But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs>